Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Hawkins. I'm head of a large facilities office at the National Science Foundation. And I wanna welcome everybody to Boulder for the 2022 Research Infrastructure Workshop. Not only the folks here in the room, it's great to see everybody's faces, uh, but also all of the virtual participants that we, uh, that we have online. So this is uh, LFO's first ever hybrid workshop. So I would appreciate everyone's patience and um, an understanding as we work through potentially a few little glitches along the way. And the good news is we've had our first glitch. So it's just like a new car, right? You got to get that dent, first dent in the new car before you uh, start feeling okay to drive it. So internet went out this morning, first thing, and uh, the staff here at NCAR obviously handled it with great expertise. So thank you so much for doing that. And I'm sure it won't be our only dent. So be patient with us. Uh, the expectation is this will be the format going forward, right? This is the world in which we now live. And so we're always going to have great reason to do it uh, to do it virtually because of the reach that we can also obviously have with those who can't attend in person for whatever reason that happens to be. So anyway, welcome. I really want to start off with a, also obviously a special thanks to to our to our hosts, uh, you know, NCAR, the folks at Neon, the folks at Gage, and the folks at NSO for having us here. Uh, this was not a done deal starting back in March, right? We, there was a lot of trepidation on where the pan, where the pandemic was going to go. And uh, there was no real 100% uh, guarantee that we would all be here uh, today. So fortunately, things trended in the right direction. Everybody persevered through a great period of uncertainty. And we really, really appreciate uh, all the work that's gone into getting us here uh, today. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to queue up a few slides and, and chat about really the overview and the, the intent of the workshop. And then I'm going to turn it over for some uh, for uh, to uh, our, our fearless leader here, uh, Linnea Avalon, the Chief Officer for Research Facilities, to talk about some of the bigger picture stuff at, uh, at NSF. So um, with that, um, I think we put together a, a really, uh, really strong and positive uh, program for everybody. Uh, there are uh, basically uh, five tracks to this, uh, to this particular workshop. And I'm hoping all of you uh, are finding something that uh, you're finding interesting and informative and I think one of the most important elements is that on all of these is that we're looking for the community's feedback, all of your thoughts on where NSF, where NSF is, on oversight for major facilities, where we're going. And that's very, very valuable to us as an agency uh, to calibrate uh, our thinking uh, on, uh, on how we could uh, operate uh, uh, even better in the future in support of science. So five different tracks. Please don't forget, we have the Friday specialty workshops. There's four of those. And I'm hoping that a good number of you uh, can stay or attend virtually online for those, uh, those four events on Friday. So it's a very packed agenda and uh, lots of hopefully very informative subjects. Uh, so I'm gonna go through some of the highlights, some of the big picture things that I'm sure that you've all seen by looking at the agenda. There's a lot of stuff on facility condition assessments. And it's a very, very timely topic, uh, not only because of things like the recent uh, Kitt Peak fire that's in the background of this particular picture, but it's a direct tie to understanding, uh, obviously, uh, long-term recapitalization needs for our major facilities. And there's also a very, very close tie with an, an administration priority uh, these days, which is the country's resilience to climate change. So there's a very, very uh, 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 natural synergy between those particular topics, the condition of the facility from a number of different reasons, as well as its condition to be resilient to climate change. And we have some, some sessions where we'll get into this in a little bit more detail. So uh, keep that one in mind. Uh, we've been talking about GAO good practices, believe it or not, for five years now, since the American Innovative Innovation and Competitive is Competitiveness Act was passed in 2017, where NSF was required for major facilities to follow GAO good practices on cost and scheduling estimating. We've come a long, long way since then. We've seen incredible improvement in the proposals that we've seen, our ability to do cost analysis on those. And the thing about it, it's really these four principles, which really, really make sense. Well, you know, estimates should be well-documented, accurate, credible and comprehensive. And there's only one reason why we do that, right? It's to, it's, it's to determine whether the costs are reasonable or not, right? And that's really the statement, are, costs, are the costs too high? 
That's really what we're looking at, particularly under financial assistance awards, which is our primary award instrument for, for major facilities. So we're getting really good at this. Uh, it's taken it's taken a while for everybody to get kind of this thinking in their heads. And so we have some more sessions on that during the, the workshop today. But we're, what we really want to focus on is this one, right? It's credible. And this is where the whole idea of cost uncertainty and the cost sensitivity analysis uh, comes into play, right? These are long-term awards, right? We look, we ask you all to look out five years, sometimes 10 years on what some of these costs are going to look like. You might be able to have, do, you know, next year with some degree of uncertainty, but the overall proposal, there's just an inherent degree of, of, of cost uncertainty when you, when you look at this. And the reason why this is important is to understand um, the reliability of the estimate, right? We all have, both you and NSF have an understanding of where the risks lie. And when we talk about um, accuracy, that's one of the GAO, uh, the GAO criteria, notice it doesn't say precision, right? And um, if, a, if, a, if an estimate comes into NSF and it looks very precise, that suggests low uncertainty. I ask you all to think about that. Can you really predict with certainty your, your, your proposed costs five years from now, right? And so we often have mutual understanding of what, where those cost uncertainties lie, because if we, if we make it, if we, if we project it or, or, or imply that it's too precise, that generates a lot of work for everybody, right? A lot of work for NSF, a lot of work for all of you. And we want to make sure that the, primarily that those areas of risk or cost uncertainty are articulated. And the key thing here is that proposals to NSF are estimates, right? They're not quotes. Right, that's what a proposal is. It's a proposed cost, and so that's something we really want all of you to think about uh, as you uh, generate proposals to NSF, particularly for research infrastructure. So, really quick, accuracy ver versus precision. There's some great posters out in the in the uh, in the lobby. I've noticed, and we have some detailed uh, sessions on uh, talking more about this uh, this particular concept. So, I'm not going to go into it into a great detail. I'm going to let others really speak to it. I'm just going to hit some of the high the high points on why this is important. As I said earlier, it's important to understand where those cost uncertainties lie. Right, where those known cost uncertainties lie. The question is, can I reliably determine of the award amount, whether that's construction or O and M, can I hit the target? Right, that's that lower, lower left. Right, we're not asking you to to group those all together in a very, you know, in, a, in all those estimates or all those sub elements into a really tight, uh, tight uh, um, uh, set of uh, uh, set of uh, uh, bullet holes, if you will, on the target. Right, can I hit the target with in a reasonable way? That's really what we're saying. Right, we're looking for accuracy, not precision. Okay. So I'm just throwing out this number as a, as a great example. When you look at this, because of the way that it's presented, you know, you'd believe that this is a really, really reliable number, right? Really precise, really precise, right? The question is, how reliable are those last four digits, right? Do you really know five years from now that you can estimate this to $5,678? Wow, you're good. You're good at that. And it doesn't project, in a sense, right? That these are estimates, right? Your estimating systems, that's, that's a key point here. We're not asking anyone to change their estimating systems. Those generate things down to the dollar. We get that. The question is, what do you present to NSF? That's the question, right? This, this number is very different, right? This one is what these numbers say when you look at those trailing zeros, that it's, that it's close to 123.35 million. Not exactly 123.5 million. So that's basically the framework, and you get a chance to talk a lot about that because it really goes to that third GAO criteria about is it credible? Is it credible? That's the cost uncertainty and cost sensitivity. Okay, so that's just kind of the overview. Speaking of GAO, right, we just had our 2022 GAO report released. Uh, I believe it was in, was it July? I guess it was July. I can't even remember the date at this point. Anyway, you can find it online just by going to that particular, uh, that particular link. A lot of good news, right? There are no new recommendations in this particular report, right? Our only recommendations are from 2018 and 2019, and we're slowly resolving those over time. The last open recommendation has to do with NSF staff, not all of you, or our guidance, uh, uh, you know, with, with regard to what's in the research infrastructure guide, GAO considers that we fully implemented all of those, uh, all of those, rec all of those recommendations, except the last one related to workforce development at NSF. So that one's on us, right? So this is a testament not only to what goes on at NSF, but it's a testament to all of you, 
because you're the ones that actually do the work and present it to NSF for, you know, for example, the cost estimate to NSF for, for cost analysis. It's all of you that really take credit for the success of this report, right? They talk about things going over schedule and, and uh, cost increases, but if you read it, it's really fun fundamentally related to the impacts of the pandemic, right? By and large. And again, credit to all of you for uh, 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 navigating the challenges of the pandemic so successfully over the last several years that we end up having a, a GAO report that basically uh, basically says, yep, we recognize there's cost and schedule increases, but uh, essentially the agency seems to have it under control. And that's a very, very good message. So thank you all for your part in having such a positive report. Take a read. Uh, it talks about mid-scale uh, track two in there as well, because this particular review by GAO has to do with everything in the MREFC account, not just major facilities. So those of you who have mid-scale track two will also see some, some elements of, uh, of what uh, all of you uh, do for, for mid-scale. So it's not just major facilities. Okay. And we expect that, uh, we expect that to continue. We haven't got the, the, the latest engagement yet, but we expect it to continue. Okay, uh, so what's coming? The 2023 Research Infrastructure Guide. I know everybody's sighing. The 2021 just came out. Why is NSF changing it again, right? Ugh, right? Uh, again, it's all, it's all to make the guidance better for all of you, right? And for NSF, right? One thing, a big change you're gonna see um, uh, in the next guide uh, is to really do a scrub on it to make it completely award instrument neutral. Uh, my, pa my colleague in DAX, Patrick Green, who you'll who's be talking about BABA here, uh, Buy America, Build America Act, uh, here, here later this morning, will um, is my colleague in crime on this, or my partner in crime on this. Right now, the rig is focused on uh, financial assistance awards, right, cooperative agreements, right? There is a recognized need that the agency has matured to the point where the rig has to be made more award instrument neutral, right? So that it will apply across the board to whatever instrument NSF happens to choose to uh, to uh, either construct, design, or build or operate a uh, a major a major facility or any other research infrastructure. So you're going to see that change. Another big change, which we'll talk about uh, later in, in some sessions and details why in, in our in my joint conversation with uh, the OIG, is we're changing the divestment stage to disposition stage. Right, really subtle change, but really important because the finding from that particular audit, and again, you'll hear more about this later, was that our use of the term divestment was confusing to everybody. Right, it was, it was, it was, it was being used for multiple things. It was a stage. It was a definition. It was all kinds of different things. And so, one of the recommendations recommendations to NSF was get some clarity around this. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a later uh, a later uh, uh, session in more detail. Disposition gives a lot more flexibility on the kinds of things that happen as the end of the award approaches, right? So you'll see, you'll hear more on that. Then a lot of thinking about cyber infrastructure at NSF. And what we've recognized in the research infrastructure guide is that it talks about cybersecurity almost primarily, right? Cyber infrastructure is likely an area where we need a bit more guidance on. on. And guess what? We have a great, great workshop on Friday that's gonna follow up on some of these things. We're gonna be looking for your input. So look for cyber infrastructure, uh, more guidance on that. And also, as you'll hear about from some of my other colleagues later in the session, a little more guidance in the PEP on some of these subsections and what they're supposed to mean. We have placeholders for a lot of it, but we're gonna focus on what the minimum requirements are for mid-scale. So we're populating those sections first, right? So we're, ta we're taking care of both of our mid-scale clients and our major facilities clients. So you'll see some on that. Those are the big changes, nothing earth shattering, right? No real major significant things, clarity, consistency. It's those kinds of things we're looking at. So last but not least, I wanna welcome the latest new member of NSF in the large facilities office. She's onboarded yesterday. So welcome Vonda uh, Grubasik from uh, NCAR, uh, Earth Observing Laboratory, who is now a research infrastructure liaison with LFO. She's gonna be staying here in Boulder for the time being, which is great. A lot of our major facilities are here. It's one of the advantages of the, the hybrid workforce that NSF is starting to look at and transition to. And so uh, for the time being, uh, Vonda will be staying right here in Boulder and uh, will be a great resource for you all locally. So welcome Vonda, thank you so much, everybody welcome. And with that, I am going to introduce uh, Linnea Avalon, the Chief Officer for Research Facilities.
Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here, uh, be back in Boulder. I spent a lot of years here uh, in a previous life, so it's it's great to be back. Uh, I also want to thank um, our hosts, uh, NCAR, NEON, GAGE, and NSO, and all of you who are here both in person and attending virtually uh, online. I also want to give a special shout out to my NSF colleagues. I realized when I got in the elevator this morning that I saw three people that I hadn't seen in person in almost three years. So this it's really nice to be starting to see people in person again. Um, so Matt's given you, you know, some thoughts on, on the workshop, uh, its goals, some of the key topics that you're going to be discussing. And I want to talk a little bit about more broadly about research infrastructure at NSF. Uh, but first, I thought, since I am new in this position, I might just say a little bit about myself and about the position itself. Um, so I spent most of my career here, actually here at the University of Colorado um, in the Lab for Atmospheric and Space Physics and the Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences Department. Um, and after 17 years here, I decided that I needed a change. Um, I had spent most of my career working with research infrastructure, um, the NSF and NASA aircraft. I'd done some work at our Antarctic stations, um, and I built what we would probably call mid-scale research infrastructure today. Um, I'd held a couple of administrative positions, which I really liked. Uh, I, I guess that was my key sign that I was maybe becoming a bureaucrat and not a scientist. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> But I really liked the mix of science and policy or decision making. Um, so I, uh, when my predecessor in my first position uh, announced that he was retiring, I decided that was my opportunity to make a move. So I came to NSF about a decade ago. Um, I was first the Lower Atmosphere Observing Facilities Program Officer in um, Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences, part of the team that oversees NCAR. Um, and that was great. Uh, my predecessor, Jim Hunting, always told me that that was the best job at NSF. He, he thought it was great and I did too. Um, but time moves on and I moved into the Geosciences Director at Front Office as the Senior Advisor for Facilities for uh, about a year. And then uh, when the chief officer for research facilities position came open, I was offered that. Um, so I, I think most of you are probably familiar with, with the structure, but some of you may not be. Uh, I had a conversation recently with a colleague who uh, told me you know, why he wanted to talk to me, get to know me, and kept referring to the LFO. And uh, I had to very gently tell him that the the CORF position is not in the LFO, and that we're actually two separate functions, although we, we work very closely together. Um, so just to dispel any, any confusion, um, the CORF position was created in response to the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act of 2017, which Matt mentioned earlier. Uh, that act required that NSF put in place a senior executive to oversee major facilities in particular, and we've broadened that into, into a lot of the research infrastructure. Um, so the portfolio of the CORF is, is actually um, in some sometimes mind-blowingly large. Uh, I've been in this position since October, and I still am not sure I've found the boundaries of what I'm supposed to be responsible for. Um, but just a short list, um, budget development, uh, interactions with OMB and Congress, uh, working with the Awards and Facilities Committee of the National Science Board, um, various policy development related to research infrastructure, um, managing the projects that are coming into and through the major research equipment facilities construction account, and so on and so on. Um, so one of the things that I did uh, pretty soon after taking the position was to hire a deputy because the portfolio is large and needs more than two people or more than one person involved. So I wanted to acknowledge Roland Roberts, who's, I don't see where Roland's at, over here, um, as my deputy. Some of you probably know Roland. He was the NEON program officer prior to, to this role. Uh, and Roland is at, at the moment primarily responsible for the mid-scale research infrastructure portfolio. So you'll be hearing from him a little bit later this morning. I will say that I work very closely with Matt and others in BFA. Um, so it's it, we sort of have a Venn diagram of responsibilities and there's a pretty good size overlap in the, in the middle. On many of the things that he mentioned earlier, right? So uh, the GAO audit, we worked on very closely together. The OIG divestment audit, audit we work on closely together. Um, Matt's boss, uh, Janice uh, Coughlin-Peaster, and I co-manage the MREFC account. So there's a lot of overlap and it's not surprising that people get get confused. But 
my position is perhaps more on the strategy side and Matt's position and LFO are more on the tactical compliance process side. Um, so if, if that helps you keep them separate. Um, so with my last few minutes, I, I thought I would just say a little bit about some of the things that are happening at NSF and the research infrastructure space, um, things that, that I spend time thinking about and that we think about a lot in the uh, director's office. Um, so probably the first thing is to make you aware of kind of the three themes that the NSF director uh, is talking about in terms of where he'd like to see NSF going. Um, I think the first and probably most important is uh, making sure that there's opportunity everywhere. And you've probably heard this in, in different guises, um, depending on who you talk to. Um, but essentially, it's it's making sure that there are opportunities in science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics, and so forth for everybody, uh, no matter who they are, no matter what their interests are. Um, and so NSF can play some role in that. All of you play a role in that. I'm, I'm very proud of what our, our major facilities and other research infrastructure does in the space of uh, education, outreach, inclusivity, making opportunities for people to participate. Uh, if you read the National Science Board's materials about this, they call it the missing millions, right? So that's looking across the country and recognizing that the people who are in this field do not necessarily represent the general population. And we would like to see those things much closer together. Uh, second, I would say is sort of strengthening the established NSF. Uh, Matt mentioned the importance of climate change to the current administration. So climate cl change and clean energy are really important priorities for our uh, investment. Uh, emerging industries, things like artificial intelligence, uh, the, um, the list goes on, advanced manufacturing, there's, there's a whole list of things in emerging industries that are, are of great interest. And of course, research infrastructure falls into that as well. Um, and then finally, I think one of our most exciting pieces of news is the establishment of a new directorate at NSF, the first new directorate in 30 years. So the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate uh, has been officially stood up. Um, and I think there will be some really nice touch points with everything that we do at NSF and particularly in the research infrastructure space. Uh, I've had some really nice conversations with the head of the TIP directorate, and they're looking at some really new and interesting kinds of research infrastructure, uh, test beds for new types of technologies, living laboratories, which essentially is instrumenting places where people live, work, and have their activities. Uh, and so there are lots of interesting questions there about how do we gather data and maintain people's privacy um, and, and get information in the, in the time scale in which we need it to act. Uh, another thing that's been very exciting recently was the passage of the Chips and Science Act, which I'm sure most of you read about. It is rather light on research infrastructure focused provisions, but there are a couple of important things in there that I wanted to highlight. Um, they gave us some very, very good authorization levels for the major research equipment facilities construction account, which I think we will have no trouble uh, filling if they do, if we actually get an appropriation at that level. Um, but probably for all of you here, one of the things to pay attention to is not in the research infrastructure section, but earlier in the act, which is requiring us to make sure that any entity proposing to manage a major facility demonstrates experience in or best practices with broadening participation. Uh, so you will see in our new guidance uh, language requiring that. Until we get that out in our public facing documents, it will be in any new solicitation for operations and, and management of, of facilities. Uh, I think that's a good thing. It fits in really nicely with that opportunity everywhere and addressing the missing millions. Um, we're also uh, directed to think about portfolio reviews or something similar, to think about the full life cycle of our research infrastructure and how we might um, find ways to stop supporting the things that are no longer serving their purpose, things that have outlived their useful life. Uh, how we do that is still open for debate. Um, so there, there is a lot of emphasis in the CHIPS Act on research security. And I mention that here because I think you will also see coming provisions uh, and requirements for research security at the facilities. I say this as a heads up, and also I will say that we don't know yet what that's going to look like. Uh, we realize that it's very tricky to balance 
secure with open, right? And we wanna make sure that we do both. Um, so we have a chief of research security strategy and policy in the director's office. She and I work very closely together on these topics, uh, but I did wanna let you know that that's something also to keep your eyes on that will be coming in the next year or so. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to acknowledge uh, news that you may have seen or heard on NPR or in Science Magazine, uh, a report that was just released on sexual assault and harassment in Antarctica. Uh, it has received some press, not, not as much as we thought it might. Uh, I want to assure everyone that the agency is taking this incredibly seriously. Uh, we do not tolerate any behavior of that type uh, in Antarctica or at any of the facilities that we support. Um, you know that we have a grant term and condition requiring certain actions on the part of uh, our awardees. We anticipate it, uh, putting out additional guidance directed to the facilities and to um, parties engaging in field work to further ensure the safety of everyone participating in these types of activities. And then I guess I would like to end with um, two pieces of really positive news. Um, we don't of course yet have an F fiscal year 2023 budget and we're likely to enter the year in a continuing resolution, but the markups in both the house and Senate were very good uh, on the order of $10 billion, which is a really nice uh, level for the agency. And of that research infrastructure was about $2 billion. Uh, so we're very well supported within the NSF budget. Uh, and then the final thing that I wanted to say was uh, I had the privilege of being in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago to attend the inauguration of the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, uh, our newest piece of major research infrastructure. Uh, absolutely fantastic. I know we'll be hearing from uh, NSO later and uh, from some folks from DKIST. And I just wanted to say that uh, if you have a chance to visit, you must. It's an amazing, amazing facility with phenomenal technology and some of the stories behind how things were developed to do the science are, are really inspiring. Um, so I will leave it there. I thank you again for the opportunity to address you this morning. And I believe I'm going to introduce Scott McIntosh, uh, the Deputy Director of NCAR for his remarks.